Hi. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, so the reason I'm not on the schedule is because uh, yesterday I found out somebody dropped out and I was asked to talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about Measuring 2.0. Uh, it's a streaming project uh, we have at ball.com. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about the context, why we have this project. Um, it's about measuring interactions and, in, uh, in essence, the whole chain of uh, using that data. Uh, I have a background in both computer science and business, and have been doing software development, uh, algorithm research, and uh, doing open source software for a long time. And actually, Isabel mentioned me this morning in her keynote. Um, I have talked about this project before at Berlin Buzzwords, so you can look it up on YouTube. And my colleague Ivan also talked about it uh, when we were just in production. Because we're in Germany, I assume only a few of you know who, what Ball.com is. Well, simply put, comparable to Amazon. We're an online marketplace where lots of companies sell stuff. Um, we have over 20 million available products, uh, things uh, like uh, Chromecasts. And we have a lot of additional information on what we put on the page. And that's exactly where the problem starts. The key requirement we have is that we want to measure what is happening on the page. What are we showing? Why are we showing it? And how are people responding? And the use cases are all over the place. We want to do the straight on dashboards, but also personalization, site improvement, uh, data science for all kinds of purposes, and fraud prevention. And the main question I've been asked is, why did you start a new project? We already have Google Analytics, Omniture, stuff like that. The main reason is data quality and details. So if you look at a page, most of these JavaScript-based solutions, like Omniture and Google, they measure the page. And that's it. And what we want is we want to know exactly all of the parts we put on the page and why we put them there. Now, it's not uncommon that our website does three, 4,000 pages per second. And if we measure everything on all pages, it should yield something like 30 events per second, and, or per page, which is about 100K per second. Now, the project has been partially implemented. Not all aspects of the website have been tagged yet. Um, but around this time, we're already pass, uh, passing the 1 billion measurements per day. Now, the alternative systems, like Omniture and Google Analytics, are all JavaScript-based. And in my opinion, they are broken, fundamentally broken, primarily because you're measuring a side effect. You're not measuring the page. You're measuring the effect of a script that is on the page. And that means that stuff goes missing, stuff goes duplicate. Uh, in fact, the measuring of orders is on the order confirmation page, which is a side effect of a side effect. These tags are blockable. ITP, that is built into the Safari browsers and into Firefox, ad blockers, robots, uh, hackers, all those things cannot be measured using JavaScript. And many of those are boxed. So in Omniture, you have something called an EVAR. And that's a variable you can put in, but they're a fixed in number. So you always have not enough of them. And in Google Analytics, we at some point saw this, you know, the number of users, and then we saw a bump, and then a systematic uplift. So I started digging what happened there. Turns out that if you zoom in by the hour, we are loading additional labels that came out of our data science to tag users. The tagging of the users actually changed the measurements in number of visitors or users on the site. So in my opinion, JavaScript-based measurements are something like this. Then people still say we're data-driven, and I go like, yes, seriously? An additional problem of the JavaScript measurements is that, in general, for doing kind of personalization, they're too old. So, because they're loaded every 24 hours, personalization is, hey, I looked at this product, maybe these are interesting. You know, that's, that's not what I want. And 
the key thing here is that the data quality, the value of the data, d drops rapidly uh, by time. And for those situations where you want to personalize the website, you really want to be here, in the low seconds area, uh, to be up to speed with the visitor at, uh, on the site. Now, do note that not all systems require such show, uh, uh, low latency. If you're optimizing, if you're doing analysis for future visitors, like building a recommender data set, batch is fine. But if you're doing something that analyzes the behavior of the visitor on the site, you want to be as fast as possible. So the project supports not only the very old-style Hadoop uh, uh, type of processing, but we also ship the data into BigQuery, because we use both Hadoop and uh, the Google Cloud. And we want to support stream processing, things like Flink or Beam. So the project M2 is it's all about making better measurements to allow better processing and make the site and all the personalization applications more relevant. And of course, like I said, we want to measure everything. All interactions, all visitors, even hackers and Google bots, make the site data, the measurements more reliable and reducing the load on the client because all the JavaScript is really heavy um, and drop the latency. Basically, we want everything. And of course, we want it easier for the developer to build because that's nasty. Uh, the business or data science people, they want to ask different questions they didn't know beforehand. And we took into account the whole privacy and security discussions, uh, which at one end says no long-term profiling, uh, no security problems, and the business still needs long-term profiling, which is a bit of a catch, but we figured that out. Simply put, the goal is to make the best possible interaction data stream, knowing what happened on the website. And to, to do that, we had to make a lot of choices over the years. Let's start with the start of the flow, measuring. The fundamental choice we made is that we measure where it happens. So where we are absolutely sure the thing happened that the user did or that we did, that's where we do it. That means usually that most of the measurements are done in some kind of front end close to the user service, uh, either the web shop or the API that services our app, uh, or very close to a system that owns the event that actually happens, like our basket service or our ordering service. It's important to realize that usually this means we are not measuring these things in the browser because in the browser, it's always a side effect. Now, for example, measuring a page in the data center, in our servers, we measure what we actually put in the page. We do have measurements at the browser end, but those are things that actually happen in the browser. Which part was actually in view and what was the screen resolution, for example. Orders are now measured in our ordering service and the order confirmation page that in the JavaScript-based solutions are classified as the order are now just classified as the viewing of an order that was just placed. So this is not anymore the order, but viewing of an existing order. What we also do, and that is, has to do with the volume and uh, denormalizing everything, is that when the event occurs, we record as many attributes as we can. So we record the product number, uh, things like the product type, the title, etc., at the moment of creating the page. Also, if we have an offer from a seller, we record the price and the condition and seller ID. Now, people have said to me that, yeah, but you only need the offer ID because all of these others can be joined later. Well, there are two very important reasons why you can't. Our web shop, our ordering system, has some caching built in. So even though the cache may be seconds, even within that second, you can have a, a situation where you are saying, I showed you five euros when the reality was it was six euros because you were still looking at a slightly older price. Now looking at the general pattern of what we want to do with the data in our situation is cause and effect. 
If you don't have cause and effect, if all the measurements are single things that are completely independent and unrelated, it's easy. Processing is easy, and none of the things that I'm going to show you matter. But our use cases are things like banner optimization, or A-B testing, or search suggestions, or attribution modeling. And in all of these cases, it's we do something, we show something, and then the user either responds or doesn't. So it's always a cause and effect, an action and a reaction. And it's that causality that we're really interested in. And in those chains of causality, ordering of events matters. So if you click a banner and then buy a product, then the banner is most likely part of the reason why you bought it. If the order of these two events is reverse, it was definitely not a reason uh, for buying it. So the was or was not is based on the order of the events. Now, the nice thing about having ordered events is that analyzing them, figuring out uh, what happened, can be done with something like a finite state machine, which in general is a very, a very suitable for low latency uh, analysis and finding of specific patterns in streams. In general, I have found that you need to go one step more advanced, and that is a push-down automa automaton. Uh, which is essentially a state machine with a little bit of memory. And I'll show you an example later on. So, why is this event ordering so important? Well, let's assume I have an IoT situation, so not a web shop, but an IoT situation where uh, I'm measuring the temperature of something. And a fast temperature change is dangerous. It may explode or something. And if that happens, I want to be alerted immediately. And I do that by implementing a very simple state machine that calculates the delta from the previous uh, measurement. A very simple push-down automa automaton, and the memory is just the, current, the, the previous measurement. So I take the delta from these two, and if it stays within bounds, all is fine. But if I introduce ordering problems, and all I did here is reshuffle the orders, you get lots and lots of problems. You get false positives and you get false negatives. Now, do realize that repairing event ordering is hard. Uh, it is needless complexity, but also uh, it takes time. Because the general pattern you do when you want to repair ordering in an event stream is that you create a time-based buffer of the estimated maximum out of orderness and that slides over time with your events, and then within that buffer, you reshuffle re re them. And when you're certain enough an, or an event is ordered correctly, you output it to the next step. But that can be several minutes later. And that is too long for our use case. In our use case, we would also really like to have exactly once. Also there, deduplication, knowing what happened before, is pretty hard to maintain uh, and, and hard to build. And uh, in our volumes, uh, would mean a pretty large memory buffer to, to guarantee that. So simply put, we need ordering guarantees per session, because the event stream we're looking at is a session, a single visitor uh, that visits the website, and that's the cause and effect relationship we're looking at. The only way you can do that, if you can guarantee end-to-end -end ordering. So from where the user does something, you measure it, you transport the data into your processing stack, and the first phases of the processing must be able to support uh, these ordering guarantees. Now, the measuring point, I strongly recommend using a single entity and then using a single measurement system for that single entity. Because if you have multiple instances, for example, you do a round robot loan balancing, each instance will have a measuring output buffer that will retain the measurements for a short while, whatever that time is. And because they will be flushed independent of the actual events, you will get race conditions and thus ordering problems. 
So in IoT, you see something like this. You know, you have a measuring device and a sensor uh, that are tightly coupled. And at Ball.com, we are saying one visitor should be on one single instance of our web shop. We have a lot of them, but you know, so we have a session routing is for the data quality and must have. Now do note that there that it is not perfect, um, but the impact of this imp imperfection is negligible because it only affects the view measurements that are uh, which parts of the uh, page are actually shown on the screen and the orders. So now we have neatly ordered uh, measurements and we need to transport them. Transport them in such a way that our processing stack can handle them. So we need ordering, first in, first out. Uh, people call that a queue, or uh, in some cases I would call it a partition queue. And then you would pin a specific session to a specific partition to maintain the ordering. So Wikipedia says it quite nicely, uh, the entities are kept in order. That's what a queue defines. And in what I call a partition queue is essentially a single thing that collects a couple of queues together. The big problem in our uh, IT land is that there are so many systems that call themselves Q that are not. Uh, JMS has a, si a sub a thing called Q, which does not maintain order. Uh, there is a thing called ActiveMQ, which does not maintain order. Um, Google has PubSub. They have an elaborate marketing page explaining that you do not need order because they can't, can't deliver it. Uh, within Ball.com, a while ago, uh, um, uh, people implemented um, uh, a new queuing system. They call it a queuing system, but people ran into that that doesn't maintain order. Now, luckily, there are a couple of systems that do maintain order, and the we most well-known that we also use in production is Apache Kafka. Uh, but do note that there is also Apache Pulsar that, sports, uh, that maintains ordering. Uh, a few months ago, I was made aware of a pretty new project called Pravega. Um, it's not ready yet, it's not Apache li uh, uh, also, but it is Apache licensed, uh, which also is set to maintain ordering, but I haven't tried it yet. Now, we as a company are uh, doing data center and Google Cloud. Um, Amazon has Kinesis, which is the wrong cloud. Microsoft has Event Hubs, which is the wrong cloud. So I'm telling my colleagues, OK, go ahead and use Google PubSub, because it's, it's, it's a good system, as long as you remember that the ordering is messed up, and yet you get at least once. So some events come in twice. Treat it as a high I.O. distributed set, and you're fine. If you need ordering, use Apache Kafka, because then you have something where ordering is maintained, and in combination with Apache Flink, you can guarantee exactly once for your processing. Kafka, in my words, is an high I.O. partition queue. So now we have the data at our processing end. Um, how do we process? Well, uh, we have, of course, the same requirements for the processing stack. Low latency, exactly once, ordering guarantees, and support for a push-down automaton per session. You know, keyed stateful processing, uh, where the key would then be something like a session ID. We had a good look at Apache Beam, primarily because it runs natively on the Google Cloud. It's essentially the open sourced version of the Google uh, API. It does support low latency, except it does at least once. Exactly once is done by additional deduplication. And there are no ordering guarantees, and there's no natural keyed stateful processing. And the primary reason for that is that, in my opinion, all of the Google tools have a very uh, clear uh, requirement, and that is that they support dynamic scaling. When you increase the load, the system can automatically use more resources. If you decrease the load, it can scale down again. This dynamic behavior is, as far as I can tell, the primary reason why these features are not there. In addition to that, I personally have a dislike for the Java API, but th that's a personal thing. The nice thing about uh, Beambo is that it runs both on Dataflow and on other execution engines like Flink. So you can run uh, a Beam job uh, on Flink on a Hadoop stack.
I've tried that, actually works. Now, my preference is Apache Flink for this type of processing, because Flink internally requires ordering guarantees and low latency. And that has all to do with that it uh, does the exactly once processing by the Chandy Lamport checkpointing system. So internally, it has the low latency exactly once with ordering guarantees. And as a consequence, something like keyed stateful processing is just there. And the recovery of keyed stateful processing with a recover, uh, 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 in a disaster scenario also works. But you get the quote-unquote fixed scaling. They're working on making that more dynamic, but still, it, the underlying design model is there. The Java API is, in my opinion, much better. If you say, I have a data stream, and then I do a key buy, you get a keyed data stream. If you say, I'm doing a window on a, on a data stream, you get a windowed data stream. So that makes, makes it for the developer a lot easier. And it runs on both the Hadoop stack and on Kubernetes. Colleagues of mine are running a Flink in the Google Cloud. Works fine. So now we have the whole stack from measuring to processing and everything in between. And then something changes. People have improved insights, new business models, new wishes. Things go away. So the records, we get new fields. Fields get dropped, etc. And in general, you see that uh, a streaming scenario, you have a, a system that produces data. Uh, you have a streaming interface like Kafka, but essentially all of them need a byte array as their payload. And do remember that in addition to um, uh, the uh, uh, adding of new fields and new features, you have multiple applications. You do rolling upgrades. You do, do canary releases. So the reality is that you have the same at the consumer end. The reality is that at every moment in time, your topics will contain a mixture of versions of the data. And so we need something that supports that. We need something that allows us to define a record, fill in the fields, convert that into a set of bytes and back, things that support data types, data structures, and bidirectional schema evolution. Two ways. Now, being a PMC for, and a committer for Apache Avro, I had a look at what people around the world are already doing, and we decided to just put it into Avro as a part of the stack. So you can now do uh, a schema definition in, for example, the IDL uh, form. Uh, it looks like this. It's actually quite easy to do. And then the code generation creates code with builders and getters and setters that allows filling in the data structures and finding out what is mandatory and what not uh, very easy. It also creates Java doc that includes the comments that you put in there as part of the Java doc for the downstream consumers to read. So it also makes documenting the fields for the consumers easier. In order to do this, I added the Avro message format, which is essentially a serialization of a single record into a bunch of bytes. And it was designed for this use case, or this type of use case. There is, however, one thing you really need, and that is a schema database of some sort. A very simple key value thing, 64-bit long being the key, which is the fingerprint of the schema, and the string representation of the schema, which is in a JSON format. If I then use this uh, to fill in uh, uh, data, to shove it into Kafka from Apache Flink, uh, I first of all need to create something called a serializer for that data type, uh, which has a method. And you could do something like person to byte buffer and then pull out the, uh, the actual byte array. I was recently told that this is the wrong call to do that, so be aware. Don't copy it directly. Um, and then in your, your application, you have a data stream of the generated class. And then you say, hey, add, get, add a sync for Kafka and use that serializer. And from there, the data, your records will be serialized in the correct format, shoved into Avro, uh, shoved into Kafka, and then you can consume them. 
And the consume code also has something in the serialization area, but now it's a deserializer, which has one additional step. Because the, the message decoder from Avro for your uh, class needs to be able to retrieve um, the fingerprint from your data store if it receives a message for which it doesn't have the schema yet. It, if Once it retrieves it, it caches it and keeps it in memory in a compiled form, so it's really efficient. And then you create the deserialization method that just does this. And then in your application, you say, hey, I want to get a data stream from person from the source in, uh, in Kafka with that deserializer. And in the event that a deserialization problem occurs, you get garbage, you get a nil value back, so be sure to drop the nil values, otherwise the rest of the chain may fail. Now, to give you a bit of an overview of what the project looks like today, um, we have our web shop where we built the HTML. There we have included uh, a library uh, attached to that that creates the measurements and puts them, serializes them and puts them in Kafka. That is in our web shop. Then the HTML is tagged with IDs, and those get put in the HTML. Uh, and the browser then sends the in-view measurements to a separate endpoint that also puts them in Kafka. Things like orders are uh, from our checkout system into our ordering system, and those are also via the measuring endpoint into Kafka. So there we have a very complete stream of what is actually being done by our visitors. The next step is uh, something we call the sessionizer, uh, because it detects uh, the visit uh, pattern, as in after 30 minutes being idle, you're attached a new visit ID, uh, which makes sense to make uh, things more palatable. We add GOIP uh, information, so we know the country and the uh, ISP you came from, and we use the user agent analyzer, uh, so we can pull out all the fields from the user agent that we're really interested in, and drop the actual user agent string, because the, it's so unique, it's a PII thing. Now, that data is shoved into Kafka files and in BigQuery for analysis by our people. Uh, but because this is uh, full detail with everything in it, it's a PII thing, so only our security and fraud uh, teams have access to this. To allow personalization, we have added an anonymize step that drops a lot of fields, uh, keeps the customer number, uh, so we can still recognize the person on the website, but only the number, no, not too many other things. And that is available for all kinds of personalization, campaigning, etc. So now that we have a bit of an overview of the entire stack, how about showing a way of using the data uh, the way it was intended? Now, this is just a sketch of how it can be used. Um, we have a search suggestion application on our website. It was originally written by me about 10 years ago in MapReduce. Yes, that long ago. Um, and essentially what we're saying is that if you're doing a search, uh, and right after that you're going to a product page, then we say essentially an attribution model, this page is caused by this search term. And if you then do an add to cart and a purchase, hey, those are all caused by that search term. Because then we can say, hey, the further you go, the more valuable it is, the more relevant it is. Now, at a high level, the full M2 stream comes in. We would like to do some stateful analysis. You know, is this a valuable event? How valuable is this event? And then if it's relevant, ship out something relevant and then do a very simple uh, scoring and aggregating to convert the search term into uh, a suggestion and then store it somewhere uh, where the website can consume it again. Like I said before, ordering is important up to a certain point, and that's about here in this example. After that, the ordering of the events is not that relevant anymore. You just put them in the database, and if one overtakes the other, it's, it's not much of a thing, because you're just adding scores together. So how would such a state machine, how, how could that look? Well, actually, it's a push-down automaton, because I need to remember the search term. 
so I have an initial state where I'm es essentially not doing search. And then if I do a search for, for X, I go into the state searched. And I'm outputting an event that, OK, apparently uh, uh, search, something was searched for X. Then I go to the product page, and it was found. I, oh, hey, product page caused by X. Now, our product page is an overview of recommendations of alternative prices, et cetera. So you can argue that if you stay within that, you stay within found. Um, and after that, if you do an add to cart, you know, hey, we have an add to cart for the word X. If in any of these stages you do something different, you go back to the start and we forget X. So using this, it is, should be possible to build a very, very low latency search suggestion application and uh, uh, make the site more relevant. Now, this is just an example. We see a lot of situations where this may be useful. Now, if this is the kind of thing that you really like, um, these are a few books I highly recommend. Uh, I think I saw the author of this one in the audience. Yep, he's there. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and like I said, if, if you're interested in these, are highly recommended, especially this one because it goes into the foundations. Um, we're always looking for good people uh, willing to do things like this, doing machine learning on this type of thing. Uh, we have a website on that, and I assume you have questions. Uh, put your hand up if you have a question. Guess I'm curious how you deal with tabbed browsing in cases where the exact ordering events doesn't necessarily indicate their uh, like causal ordering. So, for example, if a page or, uh, user has two pages open clicks on one of them, does something, then goes back to the other one and does something, yeah. uh, then it might be that the intermediate clicks don't really have any causal ordering. But Yes, yeah, you're right. How do you deal um, with that? One of the things we've designed into the data structure is that every event gets a globally and forever unique ID, and uh, the next event gets the ID of what caused it as the cause ID. So uh, although we haven't built that, and it's clearly not shown in my simplified example, uh, you can see what was, the previous, what was the cause of the event you're seeing now. So if you maintain a couple of events uh, in your state, uh, you can actually detect this. But it will take uh, quite a bit of memory uh, to do that reliably for all visitors. And then it becomes also a trade-off of, okay, how many people actually do that and how, how, how bad is it to be wrong for this use case? But yeah, we actually thought about that, yes. Uh, after ordering is done, uh, what sort of algorithms do you use to find relevant events? Sorry, I, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, the after the ordering is done, like what, what sort of algorithms do you use to find the relevant events, uh, like when once the ordering is done, once the when people order something, uh, yeah. What sort of uh, uh, like relevant re relevant algorithms do you use for? Oh, that depends on what we want to do with it. Um, you know, if we want to do attribution modeling for advertising, we use different models than, uh, for example, the attribution of search keywords. Um, so that really varies per use case. Um, and it's up to the team because we have a, a Scrum organization. So every team that needs to build something, uh, of course, they talk to each other about uh, how do you approach this and can I reduce reuse stuff. Um, it varies, and a uh, lot of a lot of situations is a very simple rule based thing because those usually perform better. Right, and the second question is that uh, you said uh, uh, during these relevance uh, search, uh, you, you, the ordering does not matter. Uh, if like I mean uh, the even even then uh, like uh let me check uh, I think you mean this one yeah yeah yes. exactly exactly because what rolls out here 
is essentially that this word was seen on the PDP, on the product page. Um, and from there on, it's just a assigning a score and uh, figuring out for which letters this is a recommendation. And then all ha that happens here is that in the existing set, these are incremented. And if two measurements for the same thing swap places, the effect is negligible. In fact, I'm even willing to say that while here you are doing in Flink terms uh, stream processing based on the time in the events, uh, here you can do it in the time of processing and just window it together for a few seconds and then batch it in, in, the, data in the data store there every few seconds or minute or something like that. Good. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so like the key theme I think you emphasize is maintaining order in events, and uh, I think one of the things that you brought up is that in order to do that, you have to route sessions to the same node in order to have a single clock, right? So right. That the events are are kept in sync. And also, single output buffer. That's actually the bigger uh, impact. Right. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understood that. So maybe you can expand on that. But but the other but the question is really, what's the cost of? Uh, do you see? Is it difficult to do the routing? I mean, you have issues, right? When you want to roll out updates to your servers, you you'd like to be able to send someone to a new node in that case. Yes. Yeah. Um, in those scenarios, you uh, will undoubtedly have uh, some damage to the data. Uh, one of the things we're doing there is that we are using uh, a small number of instances and do session replication within the small number of instances and then switch the user to the other uh, to another one and because it's a small number you can still have the session replication and uh, um, you know don't break stuff too much but in general yes you would there's a high probability in those scenarios that you break stuff um, but we try to keep it as limited as possible because that makes the assumptions you can make in the down the stream processing a lot easier and a lot timelier and uh, uh, go much lower in your latency than uh, it's possible if you, do, if you don't do this. Uh, my question is, how do you handle scaling? So for example, on Black Friday, do you maintain always uh, fixed amount of, for example, clusters for Kafka, or do you scale them like uh, dynamically? Well, Kafka is um, uh, similar to what the Apache Flink has, is stuck in a fixed number of uh, parallelism. Um, so we have created such a number of partitions in Kafka that we can handle the Black Friday. And it works. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? No? So could everyone give a, a clap of the hands for Niels and his great presentation. Thank you.